All right, here we are, our uh, fourth iteration of the uh, Soil and Nutrition webinar series. Very happy to have Kathleen D. Chiara with us today, um, opening up the nutrition track, uh, discussing functional medicine, uh, which basically means eat real food. Um, I'm not sure if it's much more complicated than that, Kathleen, but you've got all kinds of fancy science and details to, <laughs> uh, I think really inspire people with, with uh, you know, how far we've come in really seeing that. So um, I'm not sure if you need any other introduction, I'd say just go for it and we'll, we'll have questions in an hour. Um, as, as, as we have done in the past, people should feel free to chat with each other in the, um, in the chat uh, room the box there. And if you have questions that you'd like to, just, to answer um, at four o'clock or in an hour, uh, feel free to post them there and we'll curate them and um, hopefully have a spirited conversation at that point. All right. Great. Yeah, Go for thanks it, for having me. Sounds great. I will um, probably turn my chat box You're a little bit off. quiet. Am I quiet? Yeah. Okay, let me turn my mic up. Hang on. One sec. Uh, let's see. Okay. That's probably much better. Nope. No? Is that better? <laughs> Hang on. Uh, select a microphone. Sounds Wait good to everybody else. Wait a minute. Uh, let's see. I'll get this right. Audio Everyone setting. else says you sound fine. You sound fine. All right. Yeah, I should be good. My output looks really good on my end. Um, hang on. Uh, let's see. All right. You're good. Go for it. Yeah. Everyone mm -hmm. sure? Sounds really good. All right. Okay, great. Everyone is good? Sounds good. All right. I'm going to move my microphone a little closer um, and then turn off all of these other settings. All right. It's great. I will, um, let's see, move my screen over here so I can minimize and share my screen with all of you. So great to be here. My slides. All right. And now I have to go back up to the front and then I'll just get into my preview. There we go. All right, so hang with me one second. And slideshow. All right. That would be great. All right, so I will try not to, I'll try to look ahead at my slides and not be tempted to look at myself. And I'll also try not be tempted to use my hands, uh, which I tend to do because I married an Italian. So something happened to me and uh, I started using my hands a lot. So it's just wonderful to be here. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, uh, to join everybody today and, um, and to come together in this, in this way. Uh, which is wonderful that we can all share our information. So it's really great. Um, as Dan said, I'm kicking off the nutrition uh, track for us this time, uh, which is exciting. We talked a little bit about um, me, you know, kind of uh, setting some of the tone and uh, talking about some trends uh, at the conference. But then when we decided we weren't coming together, I thought it didn't really make sense for me to uh, talk about nutrition trends. And really instead, um, I decided to talk about the subject of this food first approach and nourishing immunity and to run a thread through what I see as the common, the commonalities uh, between uh, tending to the land and agriculture and what I see in the practical application of caring for people who are struggling to get their health back on track. Um, because I think sometimes we disconnect those two discussions. It's sort of like, well, there's, uh, there's caring for the land and there's farming and there's um, the food issues and food solutions. And then there's public health, right? And, or the nutrition. And they're really the same thing. So where I learn the most is by um, understanding what's happening 
in food and uh, with the land? And then what are those correlations that we see in public health and how is it manifesting for chronic disease and for, for the public? So that's what I really um, want, wanted to tackle today so that we could use an example. I'm gonna provide an example, but I don't want anybody to get caught up in any of those details and then run around and think, oh, what are the next steps I have to do? What are the books that I have to buy and what tests do I have to do? to fix my own problem, but instead to look deep at these details and then pull yourself back and look at the larger message. So uh, last week, John talked about um, biology superseding chemistry. And um, I, John probably heard me through his computer as I was yelling, uh, yes, and exactly, uh, because this is certainly what we see in human health. In other words, uh, we can see the perfect chemistry um, on a lab test. People can have all of the right nutrients and everything could be in balance and then uh, they are not well. And the opposite can be true that people can have uh, good biology and poor chemistry levels and actually be doing quite well. So really what we want to um, aim for, of course, is a strong biology, and then help people to get their own biology to achieve good, a good chemistry. In other words, uh, when the body is healthy and strong, um, ultimately, it's going to draw those nutrients from the food that you're eating and, um, and, and be working on your behalf at all times. It's not about just looking at deficiencies, looking at where there's um, weakness and then filling in those buckets because that isn't working, it hasn't worked. Um, really people are throwing themselves into further states of imbalance. And so um, I'm not, my, my title it doesn't say food only, it says food first and that's for a reason. My invitation here is that we approach it from rebuilding the biology first, helping people to make that um, connection with the food, trusting that their food is really coded for their own health, and then uh, from there, optimize uh, where they feel they need to by adding some of those additional uh, nutraceuticals or herbs or um, other incredible um, you know, therapeutics um, should, should somebody have that desire to do so. so um, not to overemphasize what John was saying, but again, because I want to wrap a, th a thread through these two topics, um, he pointed out three key desires, and uh, I apologize to John if I'm poorly paraphrasing uh, what he said, which is that um, the desire from the farming perspective was uh, an ecosystem that regenerates soil, one that uh, creates resistance to disease and in insects and crops, and then uh, a regenerative public health by growing nutritious food. So, you know, these are obviously, um, you know, a framework that he was really speaking to. And then, and then, of course, he was specifically addressing how do you do that on a small scale with a small piece of land? Well, from my perspective, you, your own body, your microbiome is your own piece of land, right? You have your own piece of land that you yourself are creating and carrying at all times, your own ecosystem that you are um, constantly caring for. And so my um, way of thinking about that is that when you have that ecosystem, it's something that you're constantly regenerating. We don't, um, ever want to think of ourselves as something that is the same or that we're fixing and repairing and poking and prodding and trying to get to a state where we optimize and then we've arrived there. It simply doesn't work that way. And I, I'm certain I don't need to emphasize that to this audience because you can appreciate that uh, given that you understand um, how soil biology works. So this is the problem we run into in the nutrition field, which is that there's a book or a label for everything, right? So there's a three-day solution for this and a protocol for that and a diet for that. And we get heavy into the labels. Um, and then of course, we're labeling different dietary plans and we're labeling how food is grown and we're labeling how what type of food that you're eating and where the food comes from and then we're labeling diseases and then we're labeling everything and by the time 
we've gotten through all the labels, people are very confused. Now, the idea, of course, of labeling is to provide the consumer with clarity so they understand and the food can be trusted or the dietary plan helps them to identify whether it's appropriate for them. The problem with that is that uh, with each label comes more and more confusion. And so then the consumer is now in a position where they are disconnected from themselves because they are tacking on, um, are identifying with individual labels. They've put themselves into all of these different buckets on, in an effort to get clarity and to resolve an issue. And where that has led is to a disconnect from their own intuition on what it actually means to be well. So uh, this is, and has always been uh, our greatest guide, right? Our own self-trust, our own intuition on what we should be eating, how we feel. And it takes us out of that curing mindset, which is seeking something external uh, to intervene with um, the disease process. And um, when we are in that position where we're always trying to fix and resolve, uh, we, in essence, are chasing. And um, so this is the, the, the problem that we're in. Uh, for the consumer. And this is what I see all the time. This is, many of you know my story, I suppose. I I know I've been at the um, Soil and Nutrition Conference before. And uh, some of you may have read my books, or maybe you've seen me in the documentary film, Secret Ingredients. But I've talked about this before because I was there. You know, I was there as an individual. I was uh, permanently disabled at the age of 35 with multiple chronic diseases, and I was chasing the cure. I believed that I just didn't do enough, didn't find the answer yet, didn't know what the solution was. So I very much was in the chase for a very, very, very long time. Um, I don't think there's, uh, I do think there are times uh, when treatment and medication and interventions are appropriate. My, my uh, challenge here, I guess, is that there's no exit ramp for people who need to get out of that um, and move to a more sustainable way of living in which they are then getting back to reclaiming the, the power of the body to, to naturally sustain itself. Uh, and so that was my challenge of getting out of an acute state and getting back to uh, my body's ability to, to care for itself. So I um, would just want to emphasize that I feel uh, health is something that we don't arrive at. It is something that we tend to very gently. There's no rigidity to it. Uh, when it's done well, it is just naturally uh, woven into our daily life. And uh, much like we would teach this to our children is something that they are embodying and witnessing uh, I do feel that health is something that uh, families need to do together. It needs to be modeled and um, observed and practiced and discussed and the language needs to be there. So this is true for all things that we most dearly value. And uh, it's really what we talk about when we think about being a good citizen uh, is that we are in essence modeling what we would expect and want of that next generation. And health is really at the top of that list. So um, the way that I like to teach it is that our bodies are really following a cyclical pattern of that our mindset, uh, not my set of beliefs, but your own set of beliefs about what it means to be healthy. And this of course, also is true for cultural and traditional beliefs, beliefs that are deep and true to you. I know we started this conference uh, with a beautiful indigenous ceremony. So there are a lot of uh, deep beliefs and traditions there. Those things really drive your behaviors, including your nutritional and lifestyle behaviors, and that drives your microbiome. So this is very important. So we see this in um, in families, but cultures and in communities. And it really, again, is ties this loop back that our microbiome is in direct uh, response to the consistency of our daily habits. So it isn't about 
um, what diet you you know ascribe to. It's really about um, the consistency and the simplicity, as Dan said at the opening of what we're doing. That we we don't want to overcomplicate it. Uh, we want to pull back and look at that core framework. How are we living, and what are we doing on a consistent basis? So uh, the vulnerability of all diseases, chronic diseases in particular, which is really uh, where I like to focus my attention because I think they're both preventable and reversible, um, are likely and almost always in place long before the symptoms manifest. So uh, when we're in a position where we're now advocating for ourselves uh, with a medical professional or, um, or a doctor or or caring for a child, those symptoms are already in place by the time we've seen uh, the disease pathology. So it can be very, very challenging for us to then turn to food as medicine. Now, this is my slight pet peeve with that messaging. Um, I like to teach food as information um, for this reason, because when we use food as, in, as, as uh, medicine, uh, we're making a connection with disease and illness and essentially driving that messaging home that you have to be sick in order to use food uh, as a benefit. So I find it very frustrating because uh, having been down this path of being very sick, when you are sick, uh, you get very used to the instantaneous feeling of what it means to take a pharmaceutical drug, uh, which means it's, you're going to feel better pretty quick, not because you've resolved the illness, but because it's been covered up. So um, it can be a quick disappointment to uh, ingest health, really healthy food and not get that kind of a, of a symptom relief. Now, I understand that's not what we're saying, uh, but I can tell you from uh, I'm kind of a boots on the ground kind of girl. I, I'm, I'm where the people are. I've always done that. I've done advocacy work um, for a very long time, uh, almost 20 years now. And I will tell you that um, when you tell somebody who's chronically sick um, to change their diet and that, they're, they're, that their diet is going to change, you know, resolve their disease, uh, it doesn't quite sit well. Um, I was given that message many, many years ago because I had a son with um, profound disabilities. And I will tell you that the highly educated and very, um, she was right, woman that told me that, uh, I thought she was, shall I say, um, out to lunch, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Uh, she, um, I just couldn't make that connection that what she was saying, uh, I felt we had a very complex illness. I thought we had a very complex illness and she was making a recommendation that just, I just couldn't make that connection. So I think how we're telling the story, how we're contributing to that message matters. And I think, you know, if we really want people to understand that what is in our food is ultimately going to make a difference between whether or not people end up uh, with chronic disease and or could reverse it, then we need to shift the way we're talking about it. Um, and that is inclusive of me. So I used to use different language and I'm trying to change uh, my story. Um, so with that, this is what I would like us to do together today. Um, with our time together, I'd like us to consider food and dietary patterns as a whole in concert with our microbiome, to reconnect to nutrient-dense food that unifies flavor and quality, understanding what causes fluctuations in our microbiome and nutrient levels, and uh, supporting and nourishing the inherent wisdom of our body, and regaining trust in our food and ourselves. So these, again, are... Uh, big calls to action. But again, I'm going to use some very specific examples. And then I want you to be thinking of these um, main goals and kind of carrying this message forward in your thinking in whatever area that you work, whether you're working with the land or individuals or public health or research or whatever you're doing. Um, I think if we uh, think about it from through this lens, then um, we can you know, make some, some great impact there. So uh, eating on the wild side, um, I don't 
want anyone to think that I am uh, not inclusive of all foods. I encourage people to, to eat a very broad and very diverse diet inclusive of all food groups. So uh, you can do whatever you'd like with that, but my uh, recommendation is, is definitely broad. Uh, I am going to focus for today's um, discussion on polyphenols and plants because I'm going to I'm going to try to make a point with with those foods, not because I'm suggesting uh, that people only need to focus on plants. So in this particular um, slide, I'm pointing out a couple of key points here that the breakdown of biofilm in the gut. I think I've even talked about this at other conferences. Um, also that polyphenols have uh, some messaging and um, upregulating of genes. We know that when animals are eating foods high in polyphenols that are grown in nature, uh, their polyphenol content, uh, for example, is upregulated based on the demands of the environment. So for example, if the plants are under stress and they know that uh, there is going to be a drought, then certain polyphenols will um, be increased. Then when the animals eat those plants, uh, their um, longevity genes get upregulated uh, in order to survive the uh, conditions of the environment. So this is also true when we consume those plants that we may be getting some of those benefits from consuming the higher content of polyphenols and flavonoids. And so it's really this communication and um, transfer of information from the plants to us. And then I also just wanted to point out that, uh, and I'll talk more about this prebiotic role from a, from a different perspective, but uh, the beneficial ratio in the gut when uh, we looked at stool samples, not we, uh, meaning researchers, looked at a beneficial stool of the Hasda uh, in Africa who were eating mostly berries and honey in the wet season and then they switched to meat in the dry season because of course uh, how they hunt and gather food and that their microbes did shift in the dry season to uh, reflect a less diverse um, microbial community, but they switched back. So sometimes we get, um, uh, shall I say, you know, uh, we, we assign certain types of diversity or microbial communities to certain diets, but we have to remember that um, the, the microbiome is very flexible and adaptable. So it does actually adapt back when the diet uh, changes. So it is, is going to reflect, of course, whatever the diet is at the time. Um, this slide I'm talking about immune surveillance. So this is really uh, using the polyphenols in the diet because of course my topic here is nourishing immunity and using it to assist the immune system to detect and destroy. Now why I love this so much is because the polyphenols are really um, activating gamma delta T cells um, as first responders. And this research showed that it was go going on long after the food was consumed. So if I remember correctly in the study, it it was um, days after consumption. It might have been hours. I'm going to say days, uh, but let's just say for the sake of um, the excitement of it, that the point being you, your body, essentially the gamma delta cells are surveying. So when you consume the foods that are upregulating um, these immune cells, and then you come in contact with a virus or bacteria, they're essentially um, traveling throughout the body to um, act on your behalf as a first responder. So I think it's just a wonderful way for us to acknowledge and recognize, again, this relationship between the food and it using um, this uh, powerful tool to um, protect us on our behalf. Polyphenols in the brain, I just wanted to again point out uh, the protective component, even though it's um, working a little bit differently than um, in, uh, immunity, this has that neuro um, module effect in the brain. So two different things, um, this one looking at the evidence of it crossing the blood brain barrier and having neuroprotective benefits. And then um, neurodegenerative diseases were um, that are largely influenced by 
chronic inflammation were reduced when people had diets higher in uh, certain polyphenol rich foods. So clove happens to be the highest, um, but then turmeric, pepper, ginger, garlic, cinnamon, uh, coriander. So very, very um, important to never underestimate uh, a lot of the herbs and spices um, that people can be cooking with, not only for their influence on the microbiome, but also their protective elements on the brain. So I don't know if you guys have on your end, if your thing is covered, but mine is. All right, so the slide header says, oh, this is when we honor the whole. So um, this particular slide is looking at um, broccoli and breaking it down into its three components. I may have um, talked about this in the past. I'm bringing it up again for the reason of um, emphasizing the nutrient density in the leaves, of course, because uh, in this particular study, it really showed that the leaves were a very um, uh, essential for, for the mineral and vitamin content. And if you think about it from the practical standpoint, if you walk into any supermarket, right, major supermarket, you'll see broccoli florets, you'll see broccoli crowns. Um, very rarely will you see uh, the whole broccoli um, unless people are growing all of their own food. Now, this audience is used to seeing the whole plant and you are probably consuming the whole plant. But again, you have to remember that most people are not seeing that and people that are living in um, areas where they don't have access uh, to high quality food or fresh food or you know, farmers markets or growing their own food are not, they're just seeing one part of the plant. And so they're not getting um, all of the other elements. Now in the broccoli head in the floret, it had higher concentrations of certain um, antioxidants like the glucophorin. And that actually, when it combines with the um, enzyme in your mouth, pyranase, it, we, we basically, uh, that allows us to, it's like a precursor um, to the sulforaphane, which is the highest benefit, of course, for broccoli. So it's in the chewing that we then make that conversion. But the challenge is that a lot of the other nutrients are found in the leaves. And if you're not eating the leaves, you're kind of not getting as, as much of a benefit. So um, the other thing to point out is that in the stem, there was um, unique detoxifying enzymes there. So each part of the plant had its own um, pattern and its own uh, genome. So I, I just think it's so important, again, to hone in on the uniqueness of things in their complexity, right? To not pull out and say, you know, sulforaphane is so great, so everyone should take a sulforaphane supplement um, instead of looking at um, the uniqueness of the complexity of the food. And I'm not even getting into the fiber and and the fact that we're now also feeding the microbes. And then of course the celebration of the food and eating together. And then um, I also think it's worth noting and it's clear that I have to slow down because I'm just breathing heavy, um, is that um, when you cook the food, because a lot of people will say, you know, what happens when you cook the food and you kind of break down those enzymes. I've recently learned that uh, the microbiome will actually compensate for some of that loss. And I believe that they are producing some of the um, antioxidants and some of that sulforaphane to compensate. So there is, again, some of that, you know, the, obviously you want a nice diverse microbiome, but there is a accommodation for that, that our biology is making. Um, and then I, I would encourage people to, while you're cooking, just eat a little bit of it raw to increase some of, uh, get some of that raw um, digestive enzymes in and then have the rest cooked. Um, so this slide is emphasizing another point that I wanna make on polyphenols and that is related to the microbiome. And when you're consuming the microbiome, we now know that their um, conversion and absorption is reliant on the microbes. So before we used to think, well, you know, we just need lots of um, antioxidants and polyphenols, and let's just take in all of these 
um, colorful foods, but we now are understanding the role that the microbes have in the bioavailability. So they are making them uh, bioavailable to us um, by making that conversion. In addition to that, the, the polyphenols are increasing our beneficial bacteria, and then that's increasing the short chain fatty acid production, which is then producing mucus, which is then uh, repairing your digestive system by, um, you know, uh, repairing the digestive lining and intestinal lining. So we have all of these anti-inflammatory activity going up and then a reduction in the pathogenic bacteria and also a reduction in the firmicutes to bacteroides ratio, which is um, more likely, uh, is, tends to be higher in those that are obese and in people who have more inflammation. So we see higher uh, firmicutes to bacteroides ratio in, um, in the obese population. So the fact that that's going down is a good thing. So I wanted to also note um, where nutrients get absorbed, because we also get very um, distracted by, uh, you know, the, the next supplement to take or the next superfood or the next powder or um, whatever, right? And we all, it happens to all of us, including me. Um, and so sometimes just becoming reminded again on um, not only where food is getting absorbed, but also when we have um, when we're compromised, when our health is compromised at any particular area, why that might lead to a particular deficiency. So if people are, are showing deficiencies in certain areas, then it can give us clues on parts of the digestive system that may be potentially compromised or need attention. So I know this isn't, you know, a, a teaching lesson for a practitioner. So I don't want to get too caught up in the nitty gritty details, but I thought this particular um, visual is very helpful for you to also see that the nutrients that you're consuming with the food is really happening throughout the digestive tract. So this is why I'm so passionate about teaching um, people how to reset and repair the digestive system, because I feel that if we are absorbing our nutrients from uh, mouth to tail, then we are already in a very, very strong position. So setting people up for success and really getting them to get the most out of their food is to me optimizing um, everything that they already own. Um, so I thought that this would be very helpful for us to, to look at. Now, the next part of that is that now that you've seen that slide, to understand protein pump, um, proton pump inhibitors. And why I brought this up is because these are so commonly prescribed and so many people are taking them. And one of the things to consider is that when you're, when people are consuming um, or using these for GERD and heartburn, these are the common deficiencies that show up. So if I go back and you think about um, the ways that people might be absorbing, you know, B12, you can see B12, of course, I'm pointing to my screen as if you can see what I'm doing. Um, I'll use my marker here. Uh, B12 and um, here, which is supposed to be happening way down the bottom, uh, down at the ileum. So, you know, you're consuming your, um, your food, it's coming into the stomach, and then your stomach acid is uh, separating your protein. Um, and then giving, uh, attaching it to intrinsic factor, which carrying it down to the bottom of your small intestine and then marrying it up to calcium, which should be sitting down here. Uh, and then essentially your vitamin B12 absorption would be happening there. So if, you're, if you don't have stomach acid, then you're going to have B12 uh, deficiency. And that's really what we're seeing. But the challenge is that it's linked now we know uh, to kidney disease, dementia, liver disease, and bone fractures. So oftentimes it's not really about at when people have these deficiencies, it's not necessarily about adding things in or giving them supplementation, uh, but of course, identifying what it is they're doing to create that depletion and um, that destruction, and then repairing why they have GERD or heartburn in the first place getting that restoration, repairing the issue, and then letting the body uh, do all of that natural absorption. 
So we certainly don't want to be doing all of these, this organ damage because we're preventing these nutrients getting to all of the vital organs. It is so, 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 so dangerous and um, completely preventable. And you might be thinking, well, then if somebody has girder heartburn, what would they be doing? And of course, there are so many natural things that you can do to repair um, GERD and heartburn. And, um, you know, I, I won't get into that today, but, you know, fennel and um, licorice root um, and marshmallow and um, even the amino acid L-glutamine. So things like that uh, are very important. So uh, when it comes to bacteria, because I'm kind of shifting us now to be thinking about the micronutrients and why they might be deficient, and then what it is as we move towards the microbiome, um, I also want you to be thinking about relationships, right? So we thrive on relationships with each other, with people, and so do our microbes. Re very rarely are they working in isolation. Uh, this is certainly true for the soil and for the land, right? With everything is a partnership, everything is a community, everything is working together. It's not a monocrop, it's not an isolation. Everything is working as part of an ecosystem. So this is an example um, of two different types of bacteria an acromantia and a Bacteroides type of bacteria that were partnered together. Uh, it was a study done in mice. So again, this is just to illustrate a point um, because it was being used to test whether or not a ketogenic diet, which is used to prevent seizures was effective. And what they did was they um, were looking at the microbes impact on the ketogenic diet. So they gave, uh, fed the mice the ketogenic diet um, after treating them with antibiotics and it didn't prevent the seizures. And then they gave them a single microbe and that still didn't prevent them, but then they gave them two of these microbes together in partnership in the presence of the ketogenic diet and that worked. So really what you're looking at there is just an example of those microbes working together in the presence of the appropriate diet to protect the person from, or in this case, the mouse from getting seizures. So I'm, I'm making this point and then I'm going, I'm going to reinforce it again to say that this is very, very, very true for, for us. I cannot emphasize this enough. It's very rarely a single microbe or a single bacteria that is causing a problem. It is often the absence of protective commensal bacteria that are that are not protecting the individual and or a combination of the whole ecosystem. Um, rarely do we see a single, a single um, issue creating that problem. So I'm just looking at my phone to make sure I'm staying attentive to the time. Great. Um, this is again to reinforce this message. So this is the oral microbiome and um, what I wanna say here again is about relationships. So in this particular slide, I'm pointing out that the organisms, um, first I'll describe that the organisms in the blue uh, were increased in abundance uh, for individuals who presented with those diseases. So uh, for cardiovascular disease, they had higher levels of the, all of those blue microbes. And then the organisms in red were shown to be lower in those decreased um, in those diseases. And then in purple, they were either increased or decreased depending on the condition or the prognosis. Again, I don't wanna leave anyone to believe that if I have any of these microbes in my oral microbiome, that I'm suddenly now prone to any one of these particular diseases. And the reason I say that is because 40, about 45% of the oral microbiome is can be carried over into the gut microbiome. We're swallowing the oral microbiome all of the time. So there's a couple of things to think about. And I've had this discussion even just this week um, with, I don't know if anyone here is interested in the microbiome, but they can certainly, and please follow uh, Dr. Stephen Lin, uh, L-I-N. He's a, a dentist that is studies the oral microbiome and um, studies its relationship and uh, real food. And um, he's on my 
list of people to, to come and uh, discuss with us at the Soil and Nutrition Conference sometime soon. But he uh, and I were just talking about this, that the microbes in the mouth, um, because we're swallowing them, you know, are translocating, obviously, because we see those, we, I see those microbes in the gut microbiome. But uh, what is more interesting is that it's not always the presence of those, it's really uh, oftentimes that the microbes that should be in the gut are not there to protect. So in a replicated study uh, done on mice, they used, they administered uh, P. Uh, gingivalis into the mice and um, at very small doses at 0.01%, the, the um, pathology of disease actually took place because they didn't have protective commensal bacteria. So it wasn't the amount of uh, gingivalis that got administered that, that caused the problem because it was such a, such a tiny amount. It's just because there were no other microbes or wasn't enough diversity there to create protection. So that's how you have to think about it. When I say it's about relationships, it's also a relationship to the entire environment. Is the environment there conducive to protecting you from vulnerability? So I think it's just another really good way of making that relationship. And yes, we all need really healthy mouths. So um, I think taking care of your oral um, hygiene is very important. Sleep. Um, I wanted to point this out because sometimes we get distracted by, you know, food and all of the things that we can and should be doing to modulate our health. Um, and nourishing immunity also means caring for ourselves with lifestyle behaviors. So this was just to point out that as little as four hours of sleep can sweep, you know, 70% of your natural killer cells from circulating. So it's making that comparison that just a single night's sleep and then three months of disturbed circ circadian rhythm. So just always having that disrupted pattern uh, increased uh, intestinal permeability. So from my perspective, you know, if somebody is constantly in that state of not being able to heal, they can't regenerate, uh, they constantly have food allergies, they're not getting better, they do all the right things. Uh, and their circadian rhythms are off, then that would be an area <clears throat> that they would want to address. Um, this is just uh, to reinforce what we know to be true, which is that, you know, when we're in nature, we have less anxiety, we have, you know, more inclined to be calm. So uh, this is something that um, reminds me that what we know to be true when we're touching the land, when we're touching the dirt, when we're gardening, when we're in nature, that we have better mental clarity, that we feel better. And the scientific literature just supports that we understand why that is, right? That certain types of bacteria um, essentially are, you know, crossing um, into since we're smelling them really, is the delivery system, not just through the touch and through the skin, um, but going in through the nose. So I thought that was really interesting. And then I'm going to literally pause and drink my water. Um, so I wanted to share this um, slide. This was something that I talked a little bit about in my last book which was, I, I don't call it fasting um, for a very particular reason because I'm not a big fan of um, intermittent fasting or extensive fasting or long fast or water fast or any kind of detox or any of that. Um, I think we always um, should be naturally fasting. In other words, an intermittent fast of 12 to 16 hours just means that we shouldn't be grazing all night. We should have our last meal and then essentially be fasting all night while we sleep and into the morning until breakfast or our first meal. So that to me is a natural fast, but it's really time restricted eating. And, you know, that fasting is really triggering a lot of that regenerative process. Um, so I call it pressing pause because it's really a pause in the messaging that's going into the digestive system which then allows a lot of that cross feeding. So 
Um, I mentioned early that I was going to talk about um, the uh, another pre another lens of prebiotic and the cross feeding is another version, or I would even say, uh, dare to say another definition of prebiotics, because certain types of bacteria um, will cross feed off the byproduct of their of other bacteria, but it has to happen in the absence of food. So bifidobacterium bacteria um, give off a secondary metabolite byproduct, um, exopolysaccharides, and then the other bacteria will consume those. So this fermentation is really happening um, during, in the absence of food on an empty stomach, and it's really modulating our host immune response. So if we are just grazing and eating and eating all the time, we don't really have this cleanup happening. So I just wanted to really emphasize uh, what it means to give yourself uh, you know, that opportunity to um, take rest, to regenerate, uh, to allow your own cells to do what they need to do for each other. And um, I hope that uh, this helps you think about it in a different way, that it's not just about you or it's not punishment or it's not, um, that you can't eat, because certainly you can, uh, but to think about it um, through a different light. So I'm going to dig uh, pretty quickly through just uh, details of a particular case study so that I can, again, just give you an example, because I think sometimes it helps to see an example of what it means to um, nourish immunity and look at a nutrients in relationship to a microbiome for an individual, um, and then you know that might help you ask questions. Um, and then we'll just roll right into questions because I think we'll pretty much be right around that hour. So I hope everyone is doing great and sticking with us. So this is a case study of, um, and I probably should have put a little bit more details, but a woman in her late 40s, um, who had fatigue and um, was anxiety, early state signs of um, thyroid issues, um, those kinds of complaints, um, and was trouble sleeping, muscle um, degeneration, those kinds of things, and um, just overall not feeling well, gastrointestinal issues, IBS. And um, the most obvious thing, so obviously our lab testing uh, showed, I, I say obviously, not obvious to you, but she uh, had all the indications of intestinal permeability. So all of her markers came back for um, antibodies to zonulin, uh, actin, um, several of the um, gliadin markers. So she had, uh, I believe, two high and one moderate of the um, gliadin markers. And then she also had um, other antibodies, so non-gluten related. So she did not have any markers for celiac, but she was kind of off the charts for uh, permeability issues. And she lives a gluten-free lifestyle um, and has for, I think, uh, six years or more. And is the gluten-free home as well because her children are gluten-free. So she also came back with uh, several nutrient deficiencies. Um, her copper to zinc ratio was low. Um, I asked her if she was supplementing with zinc because most people were getting that kind of information uh, relative to uh, the coronavirus. She said, yes, she knew that was probably wrong because it was not balanced with copper. It was just straight zinc, but she kind of got worried that she should be taking high levels of zinc. So she suspected um, that was, she suspected that was wrong, but she did it anyway. And uh, so that threw her copper to zinc ratio off. Her glutamine was very low. Uh, that should be five, higher than 500. She was about 100. And uh, her choline was just slightly low. So nothing overly worried there. Um, so these were all her permeability issues. Uh, the actin is, um, basically a protein that we see in muscle um, tissue. 
And um, that can show like a decreased barrier function. And then all of her zonulin, which is released when you, usually when you have wheat, but it can, other greens can release that. And that kind of opens up the floodgates of the gut permeability. And then she had three of the, uh, she had both the gamma and omega uh, proteins were present as well. So that's wheat related disorders. We usually see that in people who have like neurochemical issues. So um, they basically end up with um, like a good example of that would be uh, that they tend to have like a morphine like reaction when they get exposed to gluten. We see that a lot in the autistic community uh, where they get addictive components and excitability or um, and very addictive if you take it away. So that's uh, an antibody that would show up for those. And um, so the common things that are generally recommended is nutrition and lifestyle modifications. Um, look for common uh, issues that she might be doing if she's uh, dining out, areas where the gut might be breaking down, infections, uh, stress, and then you would do uh, subsequent testing to see if the things that you're doing have modulated the gut. In her case, L-glutamine was a, an obvious choice because she was so low and that is a gut restoration um, amino acid and then a probiotic regimen if appropriate, which we'll get into next. Um, so this is her microbiome analysis. She has, I'm just giving you snapshots of particular parts of it. So um, she is really out of the range in many of the keystones. She has, um, she's missing almost all the keystone. And what's interesting about her in her case is all of the functions of the microbe she's missing are really her B nutrient um, synthesis vitamins. So this is a good example of what I was talking about earlier that your microbes are really working on your behalf, but if they're missing and you don't have those microbes in the gut, then you're not going to be manufacturing or synthesizing your own nutrients. So uh, to keep dumping her with vitamins or synthetic vitamins or methylated vitamins, and then asking those to drive into the cell when her own, micro her own body is not able to synthesize or make vitamins uh, seems counterproductive. So this is another look um, on the left here, this uh, family level uh, of the US healthy population. This would be, this donut chart is like what an abundant uh, bacterial genome would look like. And then this is her sample. So it doesn't look all that bad, except if you really look at it, these are representing whole species. So she really doesn't have enough diversity. She's missing some pretty significant groups here. So we don't have enough um, species and she's too dominant in, in, in very particular species. So we should really see much smaller amounts here. Um, and, you know, we want to see some diversity and we, we need to see some keystone, um, uh, keystone, uh, species in there as well. So she doesn't have enough abundance there. Um, this just looks at the total uh, biosynthesis of all of them. And her numbers are not, I mean, it's right on the cusp there, it's low. You can see she's in the healthy low here, but we need to get her up here in the green because she's, she's staggering low and her um, micronutrient test showed that she was low. And then when we look here, she was low, if you remember, in her B1 vitamin, but if you can see, she's high. Now, I have other markers on her to show that her lactate was too high, and, and thiamine is actually used as a precursor to clear lactate. So she's building up too much lactate in her body, and so her she's producing uh, overproducing her um, thiamine as a precursor and is trying to clear that. So there are other reasons uh, which is obviously why you, you need to work with somebody who can help you make sense of it and, you know, put it all together. That's not the point here. The point is to just essentially look at um, when, the when the microbiome is deficient, when we have these deficiencies in the gut, we are going to um, miss a, an opportunity to get some energy production and some metabolism from, from these nutrients. So this is the B6. Um, and then this is uh, folate and B12. 
again, these are microbes. The, this is this is a synthesis of the microbes. This is not um, this is not a micronutrient evaluation. This is her microbiome, and then these are the keystone species. Look at look at all of the species that are not detected. So she's missing all these species here. Now this is something worth pointing out. She has um, no lactobacillus species. So someone might say, okay, well, we should, she should take lots of lactobacillus. She's missing that species. Um, but she had so much lactate in her body. She was building up too much lactate. Um, if she were to take a lot of species with lactate, then that actually would create some, um, some damage. So we don't do that first. Uh, we want to clear that out. So um, we would help her do that instead. So thiamine, why somebody might also have um, a challenge with thiamine too, like why it gets depleted. Um, hers, there are a couple of other reasons for that, but another thing just to point out that's kind of happening for her is she drinks a lot of tea. So you have to really always look at the lifestyle. You have to look at the individual. What are the things that they're doing? What are their natural behaviors? What are they consuming on a regular basis? And then correlate that with um, how you might want to address it. You know, so it's it's important to just make these uh, larger questions and then educate people on the things they're doing. Does it mean she shouldn't drink tea? No. Does it mean she needs to pull back a little bit right now and make some adjustments? Yes, and then we get that gut repaired and get some diversity in there and then she can resume or make some adjustments. But in some cases, people do have, maybe people overdoing a certain type of lifestyle behavior and that's a nice opportunity to talk about that as well. And then glutamine we talked about, which is an amino acid. She was very nervous about glutamine because she'd heard things about it being an excitor, cytotoxin. People can um, get anxiety from uh, glutamine. But um, I reminded her that she would know that right away. You could take a small dose, like three grams of glutamine, and you would know right away if it made you nervous or anxious, uh, and you would, could discontinue it and the body would clear it. So that was comforting for her to know that she did not have to um, be afraid of that for any particular reason in her case. Um, so the key message here for her is to really use, and for all of us, quite frankly, uh, to use our microbes as our allies uh, in vitamin production, okay, because they are um, sometimes when our vitamins are deficient or low, they are really the answer to making sure that we're synthesizing them and getting those nutrients back where they need to be on a regular basis. Um, they are also secreting and responding to neurotransmitters. So they're an important part of creating a, a calm body and calm mind. And then of course, uh, the, the terrain, our own ecosystem is always going to be um, critical and more important, it's always going to trump dietary theory. So we don't want to get overly focused on what diet should I be on, whatever diet does not trigger inflammation. And what's triggering inflammation in people is the lipopolysaccharides getting across that um, the barrier, the epithelial barrier. So you don't want that to happen. Every single time every human being eats, we are creating an inflammatory process. We are opening up those tight junctions. Everybody has permeability. It's what's it's supposed to happen. What you don't want to do is to have that be a chronic dysregulated process where it's not opening and closing normally and it's not repairing. So if you have these lipopolysaccharides that are constantly crossing that barrier and creating an inflammatory process, then that means that you have uh, a challenging um, you know, inflammatory system is, is in underway really that needs to be addressed. And finally, uh, in her case, and in so many cases, including my own, speaking from experience, we all need to honor our transitions. And I think that um, what we've learned certainly over the last year is that we all have so much to bear. And um, in her case, she was really carrying the burden of a very difficult time uh, with children that were sick. And now I was, essentially creating some space for her to heal and to be well. And um, nobody had done that for her. So she was feeling very, very depleted and it was time for her to care for herself. And we all need that. 
So we have to remember that, um, you know, we, we go through different challenges in our life and sometimes it's just a shift. We're taking rest um, and taking pause and, and then picking up and moving on. And sometimes we're just shifting gears altogether into a completely different um, transition in our life, but to not keep carrying the burden of our past illnesses or the illnesses of people who we've cared for, whether it be our children or our parents or our spouses, to make those transitions and then move on uh, with a new ecosystem and a new microbiome that our bodies are regenerating, they are repairing and they're incredible. And to, uh, I am a living example of that certainly. And so I just am here maybe to inspire you to believe and to um, honor yourselves and trust yourselves uh, in your capacity to do that. Uh, and that our food is very extraordinary and it has the capacity to, um, to work with us in a very special and dynamic way. So I appreciate you and I thank you all for being here. And um, I am going to turn off my share and I'd love to answer questions. Um, stop the share. There we go. All right. Hey, Kathleen. <laughs> Brilliant, as usual. Um, <laughs> I, I want to just emphasize a couple of points, if I if I may, but then please, yes, uh, try to uh, you know uh, manage the questions on the on the chat, so people should feel free. Sorry, on the okay. Q and A to post there. Okay. Um, you know, I think the point about the uh, you know microbiome being the, um, the the driver of all this structure, I think maybe got lost a little bit in there was the the foods that you need to eat for the microbiome in the gut mm. to flourish and. I know you've explained this to me in the past about fiber and you know the fiber of the carrot the fiber of the celery people take their things and they juice them or they have bars that have quote unquote fiber added but it's actually the fiber in the food in the grain in the in the root etc yes that your microbes eat which causes them to be able to exist and if you yes. don't eat those whole foods correct me if I, but that's that's I want to just yeah, yeah, no, I love that. And uh, you know, you're right. And I think um, you're 100% right. I sort of thought I was, um, I, I mean, when I say like honor the whole with the broccoli, and I'm kind of pointing out that the nutrients are in all of those things in the complexity of it, you're right in the sense that, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't drive home the fiber and that the fiber is the fuel and feeding those nutrients. And that in essence, if they don't eat, they don't multiply and they don't feed each other. And then they produce byproducts that, you know, and all of that. And, and that is the most, it's probably the most important thing really, right? Like we could do a whole discussion on if you're not chewing it, you're not producing the enzymes that then, you know, essentially, um, you know, make the food bioavailable, right? So I, I think there were a lot of ways that I tried to touch on that by, um, by implying it, but, but I think what, what happens, well, I guess what I keep hearing from the streets, right? I, I don't know, I'm kind of this, I keep getting the messages that, that keep coming back is um, that pe that people are people understand that, or they understand that they need to eat the food, uh, but then they struggle with the the time element or the um, so so the the challenge that we have collectively, you and the farmers and all of us, isn't that people don't know that; it's that they've been seduced by convenience. But I mean, now we've got COVID and people are locked in their houses and they got more time to cook. Regardless, what I've heard from you is point blank, if you don't actually eat real food, whole food, all the rest of this conversation is moot. I mean, you can't, yes. you can't buy processed products and eat them and expect your microbiome to function well. End of conversation. You may right, have- You just said it and I, exactly, you, yeah. You have a hard time with your schedule, sorry. The microbes don't care if you aren't eating whole foods as a foundation of your diet, the rest of your, your, I mean, 
I want you to say no. Yeah. Well, I I've written book. I know I write about these things. It says cook your own food. It literally says that the whole like the whole chapter says cook your own food. Yeah, it's no. It, you're a hundred percent right, and and I think that and I think people have and I think people are, and I think that that people understand that you know when they do that they feel good and they and that we need to be coming together and we need to be doing that and i think that the desire is there and in fact i just took a group a, a cohort of students through and i teach them what's called the digestive reset we're rebuilding the mouth to nose and one of the, my students said to me i've never been in the kitchen so much i mean all i do is cook and clean i mean i'm and she goes and i love it but I've never done this before. Now she has raised two children and sent them off to college. And I said, how is this possible? Like, what have you been doing? You've raised your family, the kids are gone. She said, they're asking questions. They wanna know why I'm doing all this cooking while well, they've gone. So, when, you know, it's true that you, in order for the, that information to get where it needs to go and for it to be digested, um, when I when I showed that chart and there were there it was all those nutrients, you know when you take a, a singular pill or a powder, you it, none of that's happening, right? Those nutrients aren't going to all of those places because where is it going? It's going into a singular location in a capsule and being dissolved. There's no you know um, connection to the other factors. Let's, let's not even talk about the microbiome. I mean, there's, there, there is other synergies happening even up higher. Yeah. There, there is the cell phallic phase where your enzymes are already being triggered when you are thinking about the food that you're eating. So there's a digestive process that happens before you even consume. Now, all, you, that's not happening with a protein bar. Yeah. Okay, because you actually have to think about flavor. You have to think about it's during the prep phase. So there are certain things, chemicals that are being released in the body and in the brain when the body knows that these things are going to take place. Now that that is a something that's been a part of our biology forever because the body didn't, we didn't have digestive enzymes and all these other things to assist us. We needed that kind of a release to happen because we had to break it down. We didn't have all these cooking tools. Our digestive fire had to be strong. We had to know what was dangerous and not dangerous. We had to have a lot of signals in the body. So there was a lot happening. Our bodies were built for that. So you're absolutely right. I mean, the, there's no question that I will say it loud and clear. If you are not cooking, preparing, um, you know, eating real food, then everything that I just talked about isn't going to happen. You, your, your microbes are not going to multiply and diversify and all of that because um, that is the premise of everything I just said. Yeah, well, thank yeah. you. I want to emphasize that. Yeah, point. Like yeah, that's... yeah. But, but, but in addition, now you brought up other really important things that in addition to the fiber and, you know, there are other critical things happening as well. Yeah, you think about a cow and, you know, they're eating of grass and they're rumen and, you know, the vast amount of, you know, individuals in their, in their gut that are facilitating that process. And they're really a, a, a big bioreactor and yeah. milk comes out of it, but it's really facilitating immense amounts of microbes. That's really what is going on in that process. And I think in a lot of cases, people don't actually eat regular meals and of real food and yes if you don't eat regular meals of real food <laughs> you know that's it's just like yeah <laughs> right i i think it and i also think too though it's um i you know i've talked about this with fred provenza um you know his work um with the animals when they were taking a lot of nutraceutical or they when they provided the nutrition synthetically the animals deviated from a lot of the plants that they needed yeah. Um, they were avoid, you know, sort of avoided certain nu nutrient um, rich plants, right? Because they met the needs synthetically. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with Fred about that. And I said, you know, it's interesting. I, I often wonder if because we're, we're kind of a pill heavy society 
and we're kind of a superfood heavy society, if we are turning off our signals for nutrients yes. um, by meeting the needs synthetically. Yeah, no, I think it's a very interesting point, but I wanted yeah. to just have that home. Um, yeah. So um, there's a couple of questions here. Um, do you recommend daily probiotics? Uh, it, is there, do you recommend a male in health uh, test like Thrive. I think it's a, a colon test. Mm. Um, what blood test can my doctor pull to read micronutrients? Do you want to just answer some of those points? Sure. Um, the daily probiotic is a little bit tricky because um, a lot of the probiotics on the market have a very, uh, you know, they have sort of like the top common strains and people don't, uh, people often think that they're deficient in, you know, lactobacillus or certain types of strains, and then they end up pushing themselves even further into an imbalanced state. So um, it can be a little bit tricky to uh, self-prescribe a probiotic and then and not know. So I would say if you're going to take a probiotic, then I would do so in light of a microbiome test and then know which ones there are, I do. Um, sourdough or sauerkraut or. Yeah, so food. that way food, yeah. So food would, would be a great way. It's It can be, so the way that probiotics generally work is they will shift the terrain uh, in one direction or another in the presence and in support of food. So like uh, they will clinically kind of drive the terrain in a, in a certain direction. So you don't just take a probiotic and then suddenly now you have all of these microbes sort of living there. But if you have, if you want to move the, the microbiome in a certain direction, you can do that with certain keystone strains and high doses and the diet that supports that direction. So I would say it's not just as simple as taking a certain pill, unless of course you've taken antibiotics and you're kind of you know, doing that to offset um, antibiotic use. But yeah, you could take some fermented foods or, you know, kefirs and sauerkrauts, but then the prebiotic rich foods, those polyphenol rich foods, fibers, starchy um, potatoes, um, chilled potatoes, which have a lot of resistant starch when they chill. So when you cook potatoes and then cool them and eat them second, um, they create resistant starch, which feeds the microbes. Um, pectin in apples is really amazing. And you can even cook uh, the apples and make an apple um, stew, like uh, baked apples. I mean, um, stewed apples is really amazing. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to nourish the microbes and um, diversify that way as well. And then, you know, even sprouts are very um, good for the microbiome. And I would just say to really diversify. And then your other question, was um, the probiotics and oh, oh, the Thrive test. Yeah. yeah, I don't love that test for a couple of reasons. I think the premise of that test is to take it and then prescribe um, a diet. So it's kind of like, this is your microbiome and these are the foods you should eat and then keep taking the test and we'll keep telling you what foods to eat. So really what they're doing is telling you what your microbiome looks like and then prescribing a diet based on your microbiome. And so they want you to keep doing the test, or at least this is how I understood it before. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the mail-in tests, that's how it works. So it's kind of like uh, to keep, you have to think about this. Your, your microbiome is a reflection, is always a reflection of your diet, right? You, of course, it's going to be whatever you're eating. So, so then they're just taking a snapshot of your, microbiome and then making a dietary recommendation. So when we were talking about this presentation and what you would be talking about, I think we, I mean, you ended up with your case study there of, of that woman, um, but, but you, you know, said you have been doing this and recommending and supporting this process of people taking a, a microbiome assay, a stool sample, doing a yeah. blood, a blood nutrient test, and then monitoring their food intake yeah. and watching yeah shift. So what's, what's your perspective yeah. on that? If you yeah. are recommending that sort of general framework, why, how are you doing it differently or what, what do you? Okay. Your... Yeah. That's a great question. And that kind of leads us to the, to the next person's question on testing. Um, yeah. So right now the, the, the 
the testing that's coming back now is coming back slow because of COVID. So we have um, several tests that are coming back. So I don't, I, I gave you uh, the, the case study that I had with the first stool and the microbiome uh, test, but then when now you have to do retesting on the micronutrient levels. And so, you, you know, those, that data is not back yet because we're doing the lifestyle modifications, which take time. Um, and then the other tests that are coming back on some of the other levels just aren't in yet. So that'll all happen. So basically um, I use different tests for different reasons and different people. It depends on what their issues are. In this particular one, I use Biome FX um, for the microbiome test because that's looking at the genome of, the, of all of the species at a much broader level. And then I sometimes will use the GI map, which is just a 16S uh, genome. It, it depends. I mean, sometimes I'll do um, other types of microbes, but in this particular case, I probably will stay consistent with the biome FX. Now I've asked Karan from uh, Microbiome Labs to join us in April and he'll be speaking on immunity as well. And I suspect that he's not gonna speak specifically about this test, but boy, is he gonna give us quite a delivery on immunity. Um, and, I, and I think that that'll be super helpful in understanding even more of this microbiome and its context on how it's going to help us um, in supporting our own immunity. So the, micro, the biome FX is what you were seeing some of those samplings here. And then the, um, I also will use like a wheat zoomer or a gut zoomer to look at um, permeability issues. In that is helpful because really what we're looking at is breakdown, tissue breakdown, permeability breakdown. If the micro, if the digestive system is not absorbing nutrients, so that is something that I've added on because I think it's helpful if we're seeing tissue breakdown, um, and then micronutrient levels. The two tests that offer micronutrient levels is the spectra cell test and then um, Vibrant Health is another one. So I use Vibrant Health uh, and they both do intra and extracellular. And so that's, um, those are whole blood draws. So that's what I used. I don't know of any, I don't know that you can get a micronutrient test from your primary care. Um, I don't think that they offer that. Oh, they could if they, if they, have, if they would be willing to, um, if they would be willing to do, you know, a functional lab test, but it's not a regular, um, it's not a regular blood draw. It's a specialized lab. And so that, but it sounds like you're doing something similar to what, what Thrive is doing. I'm not sure I've ever heard of Thrive, but how is it different? Yeah. Um, oh, well, it's not, in other words, I don't, well, they're, from what I understand, I don't want to make any, I don't want to say anything negative if, if that's not what they're doing. I think that what a lot of the mail-ins are doing, what I'm, how I'm understanding that process is you, you're getting a snapshot of your microbiome and then they're telling you to eat a certain way that that's not changing the microbiome. In other words, it's just saying, oh, you need, um, you know, eat a diet that has more carbohydrates or eat a diet that's, so if so, it doesn't, when it's not looking at your micronutrient levels or it's not looking at, it's not addressing any diet or lifestyle patterns that might've led that way. It's, it's essentially just saying um, to kind of rebalance it. There's nothing wrong with it, except that as soon as you don't eat that way, your diet is, your microbiome will just go back and reflect whatever's there. So you're, all you're doing is modulating the microbiome reflective on the food that's going in. So um, it's okay, except that you just have to keep testing. It, it, so it, it's a little bit of a challenge. I guess the, what's different for me, and not, not just for me, what's different about the process that I'm trying to take people through is re... Um, re-educating them on why they feel the way they do. In other words, if somebody ha has fatigue or exhaustion and they're using uh, stimulants, you know, they're using tons of caffeine, they're using supplementation, they're taking high doses of B12, um, they're doing all of these things to fix that. And we don't kind of investigate why it's happening or they have muscle wasting and they, they can't 
you know, get that repair process to take place or they have chronic IBS, you know, the idea is to figure out, well, why is that cycle happening? Where is this all breaking down? And to get those barriers out. I mean, if somebody on a gluten-free diet has antibodies against their own tissue, that's pretty alarming. I mean, their, their immune system is attacking their own, their own tissue even though they're not, even though they're on a completely gluten-free diet. So we have some immunological process that's taking place that needs to get addressed. And um, I don't take that lightly. I mean, you know, my mother died of cerebellum ataxia. And for anybody that wants to know what that is, that's the uh, immune system attacking the cerebellum um, with the misunderstanding that it, the gluten and the cerebellum are the same tissue. So, it, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's, um, it's helpful to get microbiome testing if it's cost effective. Um, but, I, but I would just encourage people to find a mentor or somebody who you trust that can help you navigate that in an informed way to make it make sense for you. I guess I'm, I'm not a proponent of generic it like there's an app that gives you generic recommendations. Okay, anything at mass scale that pumps out dietary recommendations um, may, may be okay, but it's, it's not really gonna get you to a place where you resolve. I, I just want people to have resolution so they can have joy and, and experience food and they don't feel like they're micromanaging their diet. I don't want people going into an app and discovering that they can only have certain foods. And I, you know, we have to get back to that place where, you know, we're in celebration and we're enjoying it. That's all. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we got a bunch of questions here and I don't take enough time for them, but let's yeah. see, run through a bunch quickly. All right. I know I'm going on these rants. You got me all worked <laughs> up here. <laughs> you want me to read them? I can kind of scroll. You want to go for, go for it. Yeah. All right. No, no, no. You can, you can point them out too and I'll keep reading too. Uh, uh, I'll quote Matt's question about cooking with microwaves. So anything quickly about microwaves? Uh, I don't have one, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm kind of a like a. My take on my the microwave is, you know, anything that you zap just kind of takes the mental energy out of. Like, if you haven't taken the time to prepare it, then I don't know. I, I just doesn't make me feel like it's real food, so. I'll, I'll let you read them. Go for it. Read. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just kind of scroll. I don't know where you left off, so I'm just kind of scrolling. I went all the way up to the Everyone top. Jump so. out. Jump out at you. All right. Um. Okay, so Lynn, Lynn was saying that you find that too. So, uh, let's see. Thank you. You're supposed to be in the Q&A, not in the chat. Oh, there I am. That's why. I'm like, what the heck am I doing? All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. All yeah. right. Move it over here. You could tell from my squinty eyes because I have my... Thank you. I don't see any thank yous in the, in the chat. Yeah, right? I'm like, oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, where did you leave off? I just... Um... I mean, there's a bunch of questions here that you could probably just read quickly and... Okay. And... Yeah. Uh... Is the person preparing the food derive the nutrition simply from eating the food? Um, oh yeah, so it's a good question. Somebody said, "Does the food the person preparing the food derive?" I mean, you know, maybe um, I would say it's more an essence of the, the, the thinking and the process and the preparation. So, you know, obviously like if you're harvesting food or you're then, then yeah. So, but I think if everybody's waiting or knowing that the food is coming, then yeah. So, yeah. Um, so Mary's asking once food, once folks are in crisis, they look to you for organic food, but how do we reach them before the crisis? How do you get folks back to cooking and thinking about um, what they eat to take seriously? Yeah, that's a good question, Mary. So one of the challenges we have is that pain is a greater motivator than pleasure. And um, most of the time people uh, wait until they're in a chronic state or they wait until they're kind of in that place of devastation. And that's a very difficult place. 
um, to kind of get to people. So you're right, it is one of our greatest challenges is to articulate the need for eating real food as a preventative measure. Um, but I think that if we do start to change the messaging around it, that food is really part of a vitality and that it is, um, you know, providing that, that vital life force that, that that is, I, I, just, I think it's more, I think it's more of the narrative. I think it's how we're using it, the language that we're using. I also think why I'm so passionate about changing um, to educating mothers is because I do think it's about carrying that message down. I don't think the people are learning it in their doctor's office. By the time you get to the doctor, you're well past that stage of wanting to hear that message. I think that people need to hear it at home. And I think that women are likely the more the most powerful candidate for driving that message. Um, I know all of my boys are very clear on how I feel about food and they understand uh, its impact on health and performance. So my, my guess is it's going to happen at home. So that, that's how I feel about that. Um, the biome test, I think I forget, I'm not sure where the biome test is now. I think there were some challenges with that and I don't know where they are, where they left off and what their process is. So I, I'm not sure I can comment on that. Um, I don't use the biome test, but I think it's probably pretty good. I just don't know what their, I don't know what the process is. Yeah. Um, many naturopaths recommend avoiding gluten if the person has autoimmune. Um, would you agree with that? You know, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about that. Um, I think the one big challenge we have with the avoidance of gluten is that if you, when you remove it, you're removing 75% of your fiber. So if you don't need to remove it, then, um, then you've taken something out that the body and the microbes could really benefit from. So I would say if somebody has an autoimmune disease, then that's the challenge is that it's the, it's really the autoimmune or the immune system that's responding to these um, proteins, it's often not a food issue. So I would recommend that people try to, uh, to take it out while they're in an autoimmune or inflammatory state and then um, build up their uh, bifidobacteria is tends to be better at breaking down gluten, um, bifidobacterium longum in particular, um, get those levels up and then try a reintroduction. And then after you've tried a reintroduction, potentially do at least just do a, a test. You could also do a test to see if you have any genetic markers for celiac. Um, and then that would be a reason maybe to keep it out. So I have the celiac gene. Um, so I'm not a good candidate for reincorporating it. So that would be a decision to make. Um, let's see. I don't think there's any minimum amount of of foods or berries um, based on, I just think that's really just a preference. Um, what was it like being part of Secret Ingredients? Um, I didn't work directly with Anthony Samsell. I did not do any filming with him. Uh, so doing the film was very cathartic for me. It was really part of my healing uh, to talk about your story and your healing journey um, is very interesting. And um, so that was a very, uh, the transition part that I talked about in my presentation, um, that was my transition. So that was the first time that I realized that I was no longer um, a chronically ill person and that I was on the other side of my recovery journey. And um, so that, that was a very pivotal pivotal stage of my of my process. So thank you for asking. Uh, let's see. Recommend I've read the books about diet and the diet connection soil and health card. Um, I don't I mean, so I'm not trying to see in the question, you've read some books about diet and behavior, and then a direct connection between soil health and behavior. Um, I, I would just say that there are more commonalities between how we're tending to land and how we're caring for the land and, and nature itself and 
how we care for ourselves. And I, I think we're overcomplicating uh, how we really um, come to a solution for both of those things. I, I think they're very complex systems, but the solutions to them are very simple. And, um, and I think we just have to, like Dan is doing, uh, essentially telling people and providing some of those solutions to um, demonstrate that our food is extraordinary and that the nutrients we're looking for are already there. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that our body is built for, for health and um, everything that we, we need, we already have. And so if we could just bring those two things together, um, I think that we can really um, start to have the results that we're really looking for. Um, so I think we're at our final hour and I, I do wanna say thank you so much for everyone that's come today. And um, I'm you can find me online. I'm always happy to answer questions. I I appreciate everyone for showing up and being here. And um, it's always a joy to come back and see the Soil and Nutrition Conference audience. Even and, uh, the synthetic <laughs> world, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you as always, Kathleen. This is wonderful. And next week we'll be following on with uh, Catherine Couch talking about um, whole food meals and hospitals and um, insurance companies and some very exciting things that are being done sort of systemically in the healthcare system. Yeah, she's um, amazing. To do, to really integrate some of this insight into, into the actual quote unquote healing. So yes, uh, I, hope Rock that, on. That, I love that, it. That continuation. Yeah. And we all just have to keep doing it, you know? So I'm just super impressed with everybody for um, doing their piece and we all, you know, make our contribution and, um, and it's just uh, very, uh, very exciting. I think. Yeah, yeah. When we all make, make, do our part. So. All right. I'm excited. All right. Well, great. So thanks so much for having me and um, we'll that. have to do it. We'll have to do a, a follow-up on uh, fiber. On fiber. <laughs> 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 Five, the fiber talk yeah <laughs> all right all right great. take care thanks so much everyone